Chicago makes a bid to host the 2024 Democratic National Convention. What a WTTW investigation reveals about Richard Irvin's campaign for governor. And a newly minted older person, Nicole Lee, makes history as the city's first Chinese American city council member. All that and more with our Spotlight Politics team. Welcome back, Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. Um, so let's start with this first bit. Uh, Chicago being eyed as a potential host city for the 2024 Democratic National Convention. Amanda, what makes Chicago appealing for this? What well, makes Chicago particularly appealing is that we are a blue city, a blue state, frankly, uh, in a sea of wishy-washy, of, of purple. And so that is where Democrats say, hey, we could come there. You're, we're in the heartland. You're in the Midwest. By the way, Republicans are eyeing as one of their top choices nearby Milwaukee as a spot for their convention. Um, and so that's really what makes Chicago exciting is you have a base, you have a lot of players. Also, by the way, of course, you have a lot of hotel rooms and restaurants, the sort of things that you need just from a practical basis to carry out a huge event such as this. Um, so it would be certainly something that would be huge for the city if that were to happen in terms of dollars and after COVID, a struggling hotel and convention industry struggling, by the way, more than elsewhere, this would be huge for and, Chicago. And Heather, don't forget the history. You've got Grant right. Park in 1968, Richard Zay Daly, and then 1996, the but Macarena. is that the sort of history that makes it, that, that makes Chicago attractive or the opposite? You do sort right. of have to wonder about those 1968 references and whether that would be one of the reasons Democrats might say, eh, are we sure we want to evoke that in this day and age? Heather, what could it mean if the city does host? Well, all you have to do is look back at the remnants of what happened in 1996. So the convention took place at the United Center, which was basically brand spanking new at the time. It really kickstarted an effort to revitalize, some would say gentrify the west side of Chicago. I, I think there's an argument to be made that the West Loop would not be the destination for restaurants and shops and apartments and condos that it is today without that 1996 convention. But there was a lot of baggage left over from 1968, and there's no doubt that Chicago officials, led by Mayor Lori Lightfoot and Senator Tammy Duckworth, who is the vice chair of the Democratic National Committee, will have to overcome some drawbacks. You know, mm -hmm. they will be forced to answer questions like, will the conventioners be safe in Chicago, which of course is experiencing historic levels of crime, as are many cities across the nation. So this is by far a big shot. There's no telling sort of what will happen, but it would be quite a coup for Chicago once again to be the location to nominate the presidential candidate in 2024. Of course, everybody expects that to be Joe Biden running for a second term, but we all know politics in Chicago ain't beanbag, so literally anything could happen. So Paris, uh, you've done some reporting about uh, Aurora Mayor Richard Irvin and how political uh, donations to his campaign flowed to companies that ended up uh, being awarded municipal contracts and benefits. Um, what questions might this raise about his campaign for governor? Well, it raises questions because Irvin is a high profile candidate due to his, the support from Ken Griffin, the state's wealthiest resident. He has deposited $20 million into his campaign account and he has promised that Irvin is the guy to clean up the pervasive corruption in Springfield. You just saw Mike Madigan appear on Zoom before a court in an endless parade of uh, indictments, federal indictments from state lawmakers. So what we found uh, with Mayor Irvin's pattern in Aurora was that there were uh, tens of millions of dollars in contracts in tax incentives that went to companies that did happen to donate to his uh, political funds. We, we noted one uh, in general, Scientel Solutions, which is a telecommunication firm. It gave over $135,000, not only to Irvin's mayoral fund, but then to a political action committee run by Irvin's campaign manager, mayoral campaign manager. And then that political action committee gave $50,000 to the campaign of Irvin's former law partner, Brittany Pedersen, who's running for a uh, Kane County judge. So I have to say, we have to clarify, there's nothing that we found that are illegal about these donations. We saw that they, they were all within the legal limits, but they raised questions because when a company donates so much, we saw them donate through employees, through a spouse, 
to different funds, they're kind of spreading those donations apart to stay within the law. So a lot of questions. Uh, Paris, what's the reaction been? Well, we saw some uh, some heated reaction yesterday, expectedly from GOP rivals. One, Gary Rabine, saying that it, he likened it to Mike Madigan. Others saying when, you know, we've seen what we've seen in Springfield over the last several decades, that this kind of behavior raises a lot of red flags. Uh, so uh, no doubt this is going to be a thing that his rivals, who are much, much lower funded, uh, are, are going to jump on. You know, Irvin controls the airwaves because of all the money that he has. So he, he, he's going to have an easy time defining himself. And these other candidates are going to have a hard time getting traction of their own. Now, as we heard earlier, the lawsuit against the Obama Presidential Center uh, being a portion of Jackson Park uh, that was dismissed by a federal judge. Heather, does this rejection come as a surprise? It does not. The judge in this case, Judge Robert Blakely, has ruled several times in favor of the city and the park district, which granted a lease to the Obama Foundation to build this center. Now, it's important to note that the center is already under construction. This was really the second attempt from Protect Our Parks to sort of halt this construction. And the judge said, nope, you don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to state law. Now, Protect Our Parks also has a pending lawsuit on appeal that claims that it violates federal law. Of course, the center is in Jackson Park, which is a national, nationally protected landmark and status. So this isn't the end of the road for the legal challenges that the Obama Foundation has faced to, to get the center built, but it is one step closer to resolving these issues that have delayed the center for from really many years at this point. At one point, it was supposed to open in 2021. Now it won't be open probably until 2025. Yeah, it's been a long time on that one. Um, so City Council unanimously confirmed Mayor Lightfoot's pick Nicole Lee to fill the vacant 11th Ward seat earlier this week, making her the first Asian American woman to serve as an alder person. Here's some of what she said after being sworn into office. I know that I'm in exactly the right place at the right time. Um, at this time in history, to be a part of this body, to help lead this great city, as well as to represent every single member of the 11th Ward, the storied 11th Ward of the city of Chicago. Heather, what impact is uh, she looking to make in her new role? Well, she is making history just by her very presence on the city council. She is the first Chinese American to serve on the city council. She is the first Asian American woman, and she represents the 11th Ward, which will change significantly under the next ward map to include all of Chinatown and to include a majority of Asian American voters, regardless of what happens with, between the tussle between the Black Caucus and the Latino Caucus. She says that she's going to focus on two things, public safety and getting through the backlog that has been left since former alderman Patrick Daly Thompson was removed from the city council more than a month ago after he was convicted on seven, seven federal charges. Now, we also know that her father, Gene Lee, was convicted uh, of stealing more than $90,000 from, from a charity that worked to help children and teens in Chinatown. Heather, was this part of the discussion uh, with city council? Well, she was asked about it twice by reporters, once at the press conference where Mayor Lightfoot unveiled her pick, and Mayor Lightfoot physically stepped in front of Nicole Lee to admonish the reporter from the Chicago Tribune to say, any question that he asked should only be able to be answered with, I love my dad. Now, Nicole Lee got the question again after she had been sworn in, asked what she learned from her father's legal troubles, and she said that she had learned the importance of taking responsibilities for what one, for one's actions. So it was clearly an issue that she was prepared to be asked about. And she acknowledged that it was really a formative event in her life. She still lives in Chinatown in the house that her grandparents bought. So this was clearly part of sort of what called her for public service. So meanwhile, two of Governor Pritzker's appointees to the state parole board are out of the picture. This after one resigned and the other was rejected by state Senate Republicans and some Democrats. Here's a bit of Pritzker's reaction. Now, to have Republicans attack them and their character and their biographies, to have Republicans essentially trying to tear apart this agency of government. I mean, this is what the GQP has been all about tearing government apart. I think we ought to stand up for the integrity of the people that get appointed and the very tough decisions that they have to make. But obviously, we're going to move forward and keep the PRB operating as best we can. 
Now, uh, Amanda Pritzker pending it on Republicans there, but Democratic senators also voted against this nominee. How common is it for a nominee to be rejected? Well, so we haven't had a lot of action. Really, this has been pushed off, I think, because there was recognition that it was going to be troublesome for the Pritzker administration. Um, it, what you heard there, GQP, by the way, is apparently a reference, not a mistake, that instead of GOP, QP for QAnon. So Pritzker really going after Republicans. But as you noted, Democrats control the Senate, they have a super majority there. They didn't like these nominees either. When you had folks resign, it's because they weren't going to get approval, confirmation from the Senate led by members of Pritzker's own party. So really the takeaways here are number one, that crime is clearly a political concern as politicians are looking ahead to the next election. That is something that Pritzker, by the way, has recognized. He has uh, had some words that were not quite lashing out in that manner, but nonetheless, uh, sort of um, around the bend, accusing Kim Fox of being too soft on violent criminals. So there's that. And then also what it means for the prisoner review board here, because not only does it mean that there is not enough of a quorum on this board to decide when those who are in prison should be eligible for being let out. Also, those who are do not abide by their parole, this is the board that brings them back into prison for those violations. So, and there are not enough people on this board to make those decisions, which means criminals who violate their parole could be out free. Important roles uh, that those folks serve. Okay, that's Spotlight. Thanks to Amanda Vinicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz.